We're starting a new series today. <coughs> Excuse me. Though it's still a little bit, a little bit scratchy, uh, but part of that's allergies, so don't get too, don't get too scared. <laughs> Uh, we're starting a, n- a new series today uh, on the state, and I don't know if you guys are, are fans of, of, of literary works of art, but this uh, picture here, it might, might not be easy to see, but it's actually from that uh, 1984 by George Orwell. Uh, <laughs> I thought it was appropriate. Uh, in generations past, th- the church did this thing, and it always does, so it's not, you know, this is just something we always tend to do, where we over-focused on some things. You know what I'm talking about? There were some things we just kind of talked about a lot. Um, one example would be like the rapture. I mean, it seemed like every service we were always talking about the rapture. Another thing was authority. Authority was something that was really uh, talked about a lot, especially like 30, 40 years ago. And it's just, we went to the other extreme, and now we like never talk about these things, uh, like at all. Um, and, and so for the next couple of weeks, uh, we're going to look at specifically um, the government and what are our obligations, politically speaking? Are, is, is is politics something off to the side, or is it something that uh, is something that we should be involved in? Is it something we should be vocal about, or is it something we shouldn't be? A lot of different things like that. And so we're going to spend the next couple of weeks talking about this. Today, specifically, we're going to look at the four structures of authority, and uh, then also we're going to just kind of start talking about what our views should be towards, our outlook should be towards, um, towards authority. Now, in, in, in the culture that we live in, the days that we live in, um, talking about submission has become an extremely big hot topic. Um, I mean, I guess it was years ago, but I, it seems like it's more of a thing now. Uh, and I think there's a couple reasons for that. I think the first reason is because when you talk about submission, people, th- th- everybody has their own idea of what submission means. Wouldn't you agree? Like, when I say the word submission, some of you are going to think of it as a good thing. Some of you might think of it as a bad thing. And so there's a lot of misunderstanding in our culture about what authority actually is and what submission is. So when you talk about submission, people, people tend to get a little bit irritated with you because they misunderstand what you mean by submission. Okay. Another thing uh, is people despise the idea of, of, of lowering myself, abasing myself. We live in a very prideful time. It's very easy to be prideful. It's very hard to admit I have done something wrong. And that goes for men and women. <laughs> That's not <laughs> just on that out there. <laughs> okay, this isn't a gender thing. Uh, if you look at a lot of the conflicts that younger people are having with their relationships, you see this becoming a huge thing is because nobody wants to submit to one another. We all want to people to listen to us and to submit to us and to our authority, but we don't actually want to submit ourselves. And so there's a lot of conflicts that are happening in relationships nowadays um, that weren't happening to the same extent in previous years. So, but, but the thing about, about submission, and we're going to get to the past and to the Bible in just a second, so don't, don't go anywhere, okay? But the thing about submission that's important to note from the get-go, before we even start talking about Romans 13, okay? is that everyone submits to someone. Everyone submits to someone. There's never going to be a person in this world that doesn't have to submit somewhere, somehow. Okay? If you, um, if you, another way of saying that, if you are in authority, you have to be under authority. There's no such thing as absolute authority, right? We all answer to somebody. Um, all authority is borrowed. All authority is borrowed. And we're going to look at this in the coming weeks, but we even see Jesus Christ, who is God, walking in submission to authority. And this is a very important thing to kind of point out. We'll, we'll build on that later, so just don't go anywhere with that. But um, it, it, every one of us has to learn that we have to submit in life to someone or something. Take, for instance, police, right? Police enforce the laws, but they can't, they don't have complete and absolute power in all aspects, right? They enforce the laws, but it's the court that, you know, passes the judgment and that kind of stuff, right? So uh, they enforce the laws, but are they their own entity? Are they like a neighborhood militia? No, no. They're given their authority by the state. The state gives them their authority. They carry out their authority to enforce the laws. All of their authority is given. They are in authority, but they're also under authority. Another good example of this would be parents. Parents enforce the character, the moral character of their children. They help them to develop and to grow. Now, parents don't have absolute authority, and (laughs) they 
they, they can't do things that are unlawful. Like, for instance, you don't hear of a, of a father, like, arresting his son. Well, I guess there's citizen's arrest, but, I mean, yeah, hopefully you don't hear parents arresting their children as much as we, we'd like to sometimes. Uh, but they are given their authority by God and by the state. So they are in authority over their children, but they're also under authority. Everybody who's in authority is also under authority. Um, take, take, well, let's take an example from church. The, the board, now this is a crazy thing when you think about it, okay? So who votes the pastor in? Well, the board picks and then the congregation picks from that, right? Okay, so there's, there's this process where you vote me in, but then there's another process where I am over the church. It's this really weird thing, and the same thing goes for the board. The board is picked from you guys, voted for by you guys, and then... After they're in the position, now they're over you. It's a difficult thing because when you, when you think about it, sometimes it's hard to switch gears like that. Well, I voted him in. I should. <laughs> I mean, come on. We've all thought it once or twice. Don't, don't give me that look. You know what I'm talking about. Uh, so the board, they're in authority, but they're also under my authority. Now, this is where it gets a little bit tricky because I am over the board in authority, but also, in a way, I'm also under them in authority. Authority gets to be a little bit tricky to deal with sometimes, doesn't it? See, I can't just go and do whatever I want, right? I have to answer to the board, right? But also, I'm over the church, right? <laughs> so you got this kind of... Authority sometimes gets a little bit tricky to deal with. Um, but most, most directly, I'm directly under the, under the district's authority, uh, the authority that I have is because they've given me that authority. See how that works? But then, check this out. If I do something immoral, they will take that away, and I no longer have that authority. See how that works? If, if I'm accused of something here, the board that is serving currently, they'll investigate it, and if it has warrant, it goes to the district, and the district does all the mediation and all the resolution to it. See, the, it, authority, it's something we don't, really think about and talk about a whole lot, but it really affects every aspect of our life. It affects your marriage. It affects your dynamic with your children, with your job, with your government. Everywhere you look, there's this idea that if you are in authority, you're also under authority. There is no such thing as absolute authority. So all these that I mentioned, they're people who are in authority, which has been given to them. We don't give ourselves authority. But they're also under authority, which limits their authority. And this is the problem that you see come. Before we look at the four structures, I want to say this one last thing. This is the problem that we oftentimes have, specifically in America. Not so much in other parts of the world where you don't really vote as much, but specifically in America. We have this idea that since I vote, I'm absolved from submission. Because I voted for them, I don't have to submit to them. Specifically, I'm talking about the government. Okay, now, we're going to build on this a little bit later on, but we kind of get this idea that, hey, I don't have to submit. They answer to me. And this is a very dangerous place to put yourself in because what you're saying is you're saying, I don't have to be submitted to authority. Everybody has to submit to my authority. And in so doing, you put yourself over God's authority. And we're going to look at what I mean by that in just a minute. And there's lots of different examples we could give for this. I mean, sometimes people do it to a pastor. Sometimes they do it to a board member, right? So we voted for you. You answered to us. And that's just not really a healthy idea. Um, board members should be seen, remember, with respect. That's the first thing. Because they're giving their time and energy and effort to help the church to conduct its business and also to help the, church and the pastor to carry out the vision of the church. This is a very important job to have. And I think that sometimes people get this idea, well, hey, if they don't play ball, you just get rid of them and get a new board. And that's not, that's not a good attitude to have. Board members are important, and they should also be respected for their position. And I think sometimes people are willing to give partial authority but not complete. And let me explain, okay? There's a lot of people since I got here who respect me because I'm the pastor, not realizing that my authority extends if you respect me, you should also respect the board. If you respect me, you should also respect the staff, Melissa and, and Simon. Now, I'm not accusing anybody here of anything, okay? I'm just showing the example of how authority flows like that. That's how authority always works. So let's look at the four structures, the four basic structures of authority. And the first one 
is the structure of the house, or also called the family. Now, we see a lot of different examples, but I think we could just flip to Ephesians and get a real basic idea of it. We're not going to spend much time here. Children, obey your parents and the Lord because this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may have a long life in the land. So we see this, the, the family structure. It's a, it's a structure of authority that God has appointed. The state has affor- affirmed it, but it's God who gave it in the first place. So you see that par- the parents are the head of the house. Now, we're not going to look at the difference between a man and a woman and a husband and wife. That's, that's a conversation for another day. We're just getting the basic idea of the structure here. Okay? But if you go to the very next verse, we also see that those who are in authority are also under authority. Look at, let's look at verse 4. It says, Fathers, don't stir up anger in your children, but bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. So here we just had them say, the parents are the head of the house, and now he flips around and says, but that is not an excuse to, to do whatever you want. And that's kind of what I'm talking about. Authority is kind of a precarious thing. As a pastor, I'm over the church in authority, but also, in a way, <laughs> I'm also under it, right? Because everybody knows this, too. If you have a leader who puts their own needs first, that's not much of a leader, is it? We know this. If you have a leader with too much power, that's not a good thing. Everybody knows this. Leadership is best done from the floor leading forward. It's not done best from my tower looking down. Always. Always. When you see Jesus Christ, God himself come, what authority structure did he have? He led as an example and told them to follow. That's the correct model for authority. When you are given authority, it's so you can give, be given more authority so you can lay your authority down, so you can lead people forward to Christ. Authority is a powerful thing, but it's also a dangerous thing, very dangerous thing. And sometimes we, we say things like this, especially as it applies to the structure of the house. The buck stops here. So we kind of lord it over our children, not forgetting that we are also responsible for how we raise our children, how we raise our, 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 our family. It's important, okay? If, the, if we are going to say that the husband is the ultimate authority in a house over the wife, then it is even more important that the husband lay down himself, just as Christ laid down himself, to the point of death for the betterment of his family. If that's what we're going to say. Now, if you're not going to say that, I guess that's a conversation for another day. The second structure that we see, the second basic structure that we see from the scripture, uh, scripture is the structure of the job. Everybody, well, I shouldn't say everybody. Everybody should be <laughs> under this authority. Maybe, maybe not, but I mean, everybody should be. Um, and we can just keep reading in Ephesians to get a, a basic idea of this one. Slaves, obey your human masters with fear and trembling in the sincerity of your heart as you would Christ. Now, obviously, he's talking about slaves and masters. We don't have slaves in America. Well, I guess we kind of do, don't we? Uh, we call it something else. We call it credit card companies and people who have credit card debt. But, you know, you get the same basic idea of the job. It's a structure. And God has appointed that for society to function, right? So the same as I am there, or the boss is in authority, he's also under authority, I'm working to benefit him because he's paying my bills. See, I am trading my time, he's trading me money that I then use to pay for my bills. So authority is a flowing thing, we see it in all aspects. And this definitely applies to more than just slaves and masters. I think we would be hard-pressed, for instance, to say, well, because I'm not a slave, I don't have to do it as to Christ. I think that would be a huge mistake. When you volunteer for the church, do it to the best of your ability. Not the best of somebody else's ability, the best of your ability. When you have a job, do it to the best of your ability. Show up on time. Be faithful in the job that you do. Don't, let, don't, leave, your, don't leave your boss wondering if you're going to come in today. That's, that, that, we should be known for, for being responsible as, as Christians. And that takes us to the third structure of authority. And we're just, we're just going to skip verse 6, uh, uh, Grace. The third structure of authority, which is the structure of the church. And we've already kind of talked about it a little bit, but there's just a few verses that I'll, that I'll read through kind of quickly since we've already kind of touched on it. Titus 2.15, he's talking to the pastor of the church, and he says this, Proclaim these things. So you see proclamation is a part of what a pastor is called to do. Encourage and rebuke with all authority. So we see that the pastor has authority in the church. 
right? We also see that he has, uh, he's not just supposed to encourage, he's also supposed to rebuke. We see some patterns here. And then he says, let no one disregard you. But then he also, he doesn't just leave it there because if we go back to chapter one, we see some stipulations that he gives specifically for the pastor, also called um, elders in Paul's writings. An elder must be blameless. This is in verse six. An elder must be blameless, the husband of one wife with faithful children who are not accused of wilderness, sorry, wildness, wildness or rebellion. Now, we're going to look at that a, a different day. But for n- right now, the, the idea that I'm kind of trying to build here is that the same as a pastor is in authority is also under authority. There's restrictions to authority. There's always restrictions to authority. Nobody has complete power. This is, uh, this is actually why they, 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 strong, they, they, they don't allow pastors and the pastor's wife to both be on the board because the pastor functions, at least in the sense of God, as the head of the board. And if his wife is on there too, it's really not a good idea. It's a conflict of interest, right? Even if the church, <laughs> even if the church is okay with it, they sh- shouldn't be. Gracie shouldn't be on the board. You see what I mean? They're just, they're just not good to have her. <laughs> uh, you, you get what I'm saying? It's not good to have her uh, on that. We can be teams off <laughs> the board, but when it comes to the board, my wife shouldn't be on the board. That's, that shouldn't happen. Um, so then we get to First Timothy 3, and it says this. It says, Deacon, deacons, now this is, in the assemblies of God, we, we don't have, we have it a little bit differently. Some churches call them bishops, some churches call them deacons. There, there's lots of different names for them. What we have in the assemblies of God is we have board members who function as the deacons. It hasn't always been, been that way. Some churches don't follow that. But that's the general guideline when it comes to how Assemblies of God churches run. So when it says deacons, we're talking about board members here, okay? Uh, deacons, likewise, should be worthy of respect, not hypocritical, not drinking a lot of wine, not greedy for money. And you see here, once again, the same as the board is in authority, they're also under authority. Everybody who has authority is under authority as well. There is no ultimate authority besides God, obviously. So then we get to the fourth and final stru- of, of, the, of the basic authority structures that the Lord himself has appointed. And this is the one we're going to be spending the next couple weeks looking at, and that's the government. Now, this is the difficulty because we live in very corrupt times with a lot of bad things happening. And so it's very hard to know what we're supposed to do because it's a lot easier to know what you're supposed to do with the authority when they are doing what they're supposed to be doing. What do you do when they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing? How does that affect you and your Christian walk and your Christian life? And this becomes so difficult because there's a lot of illegal, very illegal things that are coming to light, and it's hard to, to keep a good attitude when there just keeps being more illegal things and just, oh, wooey. And then there's some things that, that when they started going, I mean, oh, it got pretty bad pretty pretty fast. I mean, I'm still upset about Benghazi, and that was that was years ago. And, uh, you know, there's just a lot of things haven't really been answered for. So how do you as a Christian navigate this mess and move forward with a good attitude? And what do we have to do? Are we supposed to vote or are we not supposed to vote? What's going on there? Um, I was actually asked by somebody a couple weeks ago whether um, what my views were on whether um, on war and whether you could be a Christian and go to war. And boy, oh boy, if there was ever such a thing as opening a big can of worms, I didn't, I didn't ever give my answer. I said, well, what, what's your view? And they gave, and somebody else was sitting there, and they gave their view, and I listened, and I thought about it. But I never gave my view because I didn't want eh. that, to. That's something that needs to be answered on like a question night or something. That's not, not something you can answer in a five-second conversation. So, okay, uh, the fourth structure being, being the government. Let's look at Romans 13. We're going to read all seven verses. Don't worry too much. If you don't get all of it, we're kind of going to read through part of it again, okay? Let everyone submit to the governing authorities. This is the government. Since there is no authority except from God. And the authorities that exist are instituted by God. Now, generally speaking, this, this still applies to other things besides the, the political government. This is also other leaders, too. God has established the idea of authority because God is not a God of chaos. He's a God of order and, and so then we move on to verse 2. So then the one who resists the authority is opposing God's command. And those who oppose it will bring judgment on themselves. Now this is, hard, once again, hard to stomach these words when we live in the days that we live in, isn't it? <laughs> so verse 3. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. That one's a little bit hard, isn't it? <laughs> uh, I don't necessarily agree with that one, do you? <laughs> But do you, uh, do you want to be af- unafraid of the one in authority? Do what is good, and you will have its approval. For it is God's servant for your good. 
But if you do wrong, be afraid, because it does not carry the sword for no reason. For it is God's servant and avenger that brings wrath on the one who does wrong. Therefore, you must submit not only because of wrath, but also because of your conscience. And for this reason, you pay taxes, since the authorities are God's servants, continually attending to these tasks. See, I, this is my view. My view is taxation is theft. I'm an American, right? But I still pay taxes because I'm a Christian. See what I mean? Can you get what I'm saying here? So p- verse 7, pay your obligations to everyone. Taxes to those who owe taxes. Tolls to those, uh, to those you owe tolls. Respect to those you owe respect. And honor to those you owe honor. So this verse is usually ignored by, by modern verses, are usually ignored by the modern audience. And I think it's n- extremely important that we talk about these, these things because, I mean, Paul didn't, God doesn't. I think it's important that we don't. Stop talking about it. So we see here authorities from God, which means that authority functions as his arm. Now, I know what you're going to do. You're going to say, yeah, I hear what you're saying, but well, let me unpack what that means, okay? So first off, that means that the government estab- the governing authorities, they establish order and they give direction. A lot of times, young people have a hard time knowing what's my purpose in life, where's God leading, because they're not submitted to authority. Most of us are not going to have a light come down from above. God is most of the time going to encourage leaders in your life, and they're going to guide you along and help you walk in purpose. But what the younger people try to do is they try to ignore the older people and just try to find my purpose by what I feel and what I enjoy. You can't build your whole future around something you enjoy doing. I mean, those of you who are older, you know what I'm talking about. You don't always enjoy it for the rest of your life, do you? <laughs> Not only that, but uh, what you enjoy doesn't always pay the bills, does it? Uh, I had one woman on a, on a worship team that she loved music. She loved singing. Man, did she love it. And her voice was the most tone deaf, ooh, unpleasant sound I think I've ever had the un- misfortune of hearing. It was not good. It was not good at all. Uh, tried to teach her lessons literally went nowhere. Nowhere. I, I've never trained. I, I used to always think that anybody could sing. You just have to work hard enough. I repent with dust and ashes. I was wrong. I was wrong. There are some people who are just not musically inclined. And uh, that's okay. That's all right. But maybe you find something that you're good in, right? <laughs> uh, but anyways, moving forward. Uh, and so what we do a lot of times, <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, what we do a lot of times is we have this idea like this. Well, I submit to God, not man. Have you guys ever heard that before? You hear it a lot from like the, the far charismatics, right? Uh, they, they really get into this idea of my authority is God's. And I get what they're saying, but here's the problem with that. God uses man. God uses man. Okay, you can say I don't submit to people, I submit to God. But if a, if a police officer comes up behind you and flashes his lights, you've got to pull over, don't you? You can't judge me. Well, the judge actually does judge you. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, you actually can't do that. Um, you know, this idea of I submit to God, not man, it's, it, it, it sounds good, and we get ourselves real worked up, but it's not true. It's just not true. Who does God use as the authority over the church? Does he personally come down and handle every single conflict? No. He appoints pastors, and the pastors work with the board to resolve the conflicts, right? Think about the family. Does he personally raise every single child born to man? No. He establishes the parents to raise the children. He uses man. Authority is always flowing. What about the government? Does he just leave his altar or own <laughs> desires? No, he establishes the government. And what does he say happens when there is no government? When people just, well, we'd be better off without a government. Well, maybe, maybe that's true. But, uh, you know, when people get this idea, we see what happens in the book of Judges. Everybody did whatever was right in their own eyes. Authority is a gift from God. It is misused and abused, but it is still a gift from God. And that's what these verses are talking about. So what does it actually mean to submit? Ooh, we're going to have to come back to that. <laughs> that's going to be uh, that's going to be a little bit of a longer conversation. So we're just going to introducing the idea here. We're going to have to come back to it later. So let's go back to verse one, which says this. It says, "Let everyone submit to the governing authorities, since there is no authorities except from God, and the authorities that exist are instituted by God." So does this mean then? Does this verse mean that immorality should be ignored? That if there's a leader who's immoral, they should just kind of be be left alone. Leave them alone. If that's true, why even bother with voting? 
right? Now, throughout history, voting has sometimes been there and sometimes not. Uh, and in a lot of the places, people haven't had the chance to vote, right? So they just kind of have to put up with it. <laughs> Uh, we see a lot of things happening during the French Revolution, for instance, that were not overly, um, people didn't really have a choice on. They just kind of happened. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, so there's a lot, of, a lot of things there. Well, I don't really think so. I don't really think that this verse is talking about how leaders shouldn't be held accountable by people. I don't feel like it's talking about that at all. I would say that it's not saying that Christians should be involved in a coup. But I, I think that there's a little bit of difference here. So let's kind of break this down. First off, God gives people chances, doesn't he? Right? He knows what, cha- what choices they're going to make, but he still gives them chances. And the, ultimately, they're going to answer for the choices that they make. Every leader is going to, going to answer for the things that he says, the things that he does. Every leader. That goes for pastors, it goes for board members, it goes for people not in the government. All leaders have to answer for the things that they say and do. Absolutely. That's just not from God. That's, that's, I mean, from people, that's also from God. We will all leaders be held accountable, which is a huge warning to fathers that you don't mistreat your wife and kids. Huge warning. Because ultimately, it's a limited time, and you have to be really careful with that because you will answer for it. So God does give people chances. And ultimately, there are no such thing as perfect people. But God also gives people chances to change, too, doesn't he? He gives us chances to change. And whether we do change or whether we deserve that chance, God still gives it to us anyways. A lot of, there's a lot of times when we look at people in the government and we think, what is going on there? God, we'd all be better off if you just killed that person. If they weren't in control, we'd all be better off. I can name at least five people in the government <laughs> that I think this about. But the truth is, regardless of my personal feelings, God gives people time to change, whether or not they do and whether or not they deserve it. And remember that we didn't, we didn't deserve the chance that God gave us. That grace needs to extend over to the government, too. We have to give unwarranted grace. That's what God is in the business of. So with that being said, though, it's, it should be absolutely clear that Christians should not be taking part in, in coups, in, 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 in civil wars and all these different things. And when, now, now, I say that knowing that in the next couple of years, we're in for a rough couple of years, I think. Okay, things could really go, go bad fast uh, in America. <laughs> uh, just from the different things, there's a lot of discontent. And uh, I think that the last election kind of made things even more tense, <laughs> and I don't foresee that tension going away anytime soon. Be careful that you don't get roped into a, a civil war. Okay, Remember that in these next days, no matter how precarious that they are, our business is getting people saved. It's very possible that in the next couple of years we could lose vo- voting rights altogether, and it's very possible in the next couple of years that we could go through a lot of suffering in America. It's very possible. America is such a, uh, such a wonderful thing with freedom, but never forget that freedom is never, never free, and we all go through times of, of loss. So with that being said, as Christians, whatever we decide to do, whatever your conscience lands you, remember not to be disrespectful or dishonorable. Christians should not be known for being dishonorable. Whatever you do, do it with honor, do it with respect. If you can't figure out the right thing is to do, don't do anything until you do. Think of it like this. What would Jesus do if he was in this situation? Because remember, and this is extremely important. We're going to look at this in the coming weeks. Jesus came and changed the world with no political power. None. He changed the world forever. But, and I heard this said on somewhere online. I can't remember exactly where. But we try, as Christians, we oftentimes try to change the world like the Roman government did conquering, right? We're called to live like Christ. We're going to change the world, and it's not necessarily going to be through, through, through politics. So keep that in mind, okay? So in America, we're able to voice our, 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 our dissension, our complaints. We're able to vote on things, which is a good thing. But take a special care, a special care, especially in these days that we're living in. We're so close to the end, so very close to the end. And I'm not saying that from, Ameri- from an American-centered uh, view. I'm seeing that from a global-centered view. I mean, there's just, I really think this is, things are getting towards the end, really close to the end. And in America, we're able to do these different things, but take a special care that your freedom doesn't get in the way of your witnessing. Okay? Take a special care for this. 
you know, wherever your conscience leads you on, 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 on voting and for you know, speaking out against things, absolutely, prophets did these things throughout the years. But keep in mind that your main goal is telling people about Jesus. That's the main directive. Okay, everything else kind of changes. And, uh, you know, it, it's interesting to me because, I mean, we all do this, and, and think about this in your own life. Don't we tend to demonize people that we don't like? I mean, don't, don't we do that? Not just with the government. I'm talking about people in our life too, right? So, like, let's say Cousin Joe. Man, oh, man, that's the worst person ever. So we only think about the bad things that Cousin Joe does. And we never focus on the good things, right? I mean, am I right? We demonize people that we don't like. And um, th- the truth is that that one person is not everything that's wrong with America today. And you all have that person in your head. I don't even have to elaborate on what I'm saying. You know exactly what I'm talking about. We all have this idea that there's that one person, and if that one person was out of the picture, they are everything. They are what's ruining in America today. Don't, don't you feel like this sometimes about certain people? Come on. You can't lie to me. I know what's going on because I, I think the same thing. But the thing is, there's a widespread problem in America, and it will not be resolved by one person being in or out of office. It's just not. We need to be in prayer in these days. We need to be in prayer for repentance for the church and how we've conducted ourselves. We need to also be in prayer that God would open doors for ministry. Because once again, the days are very short. This isn't the time for pay squabbles. This isn't the time to get your eyes completely focused on the government. It's, your, it's, it's time for us to get our eyes focused on Christ. <clears throat> so let's hop over to verse 7, which says, Pay your obligations to everyone, Taxes to those you owe taxes. See, he's not just talking about money, is he? When he said, pay your obligations, he's not talking about money. Pay, give money to your obligations. He didn't say that. Pay your obligations to everyone. Taxes to those you owe taxes, that's money. Tolls to those you owe tolls, that's also money. Respect to those you owe respect, that's not money. And honor to those you owe honor. One of the most difficult things as a pastor to do is to have your own political views and still point people towards Christ. That's very difficult to do. It wasn't difficult before I was a pastor. <laughs> now it's difficult to do because I have a lot of opinions, and I try very hardly, uh, very diff- hard not to, not to emphasize them. But here's the thing: you hear people say this a lot. That's not my president. Yes, he is your president. There's only one America, and just because the person you didn't want in office is in office doesn't mean they're not your your your, your president. That's not how authority works. You don't like the president. Okay, that's fine. You didn't vote for him. That's also fine. Okay, these are all fine to have. But keep in mind that, yes, he is still your president or your vice president or whoever else, if they're voted in. America doesn't have two different governments. It only has one. And Romans is absolutely clear here, here. Respect to those who owe respect. There are some people who deserve respect simply because of the office that they're in, regardless of how well they wear the hat. You get what I'm saying? From this stage, have, I, have you ever heard me criticize, by criticize I mean nitpick, President Biden, President Bush, President Reagan, President Obama, President Trump? No, no you have not. And I work very hard not to do that. Keep in mind that yes, they are still our president. And check this out. I heard this said back four years ago. They said, wanting wanting the captain of the ship that you are on to fail (laughs) is not the best of ideas. And I think that's absolutely true. Um, You know, it is the captain of the ship. (laughs) And we might want to think about praying for them more. And we'll come back to this more. But um, every time that you look in the news and get really frustrated, I I challenge you to pray about it instead of rant about it. That's something that I think that we've kind of lost sight of because of how divisive things have become. So no matter how bad, don't forget that whoever we have in, 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 in power and authority is not the emperor of Rome. <laughs> uh, and I say that because they, they were voted in, but then also because Rome was doing a lot of jacked up things, <laughs> way worse than our, than our current leadership is doing. And yet Paul says here in verse uh, 3 through 4, he says this, uh, for rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Do you know who killed Paul? The government that he's talking about. They killed him. Do you know why they killed him? Not really for anything. He didn't do anything wrong, but he was killed for it. And if you look around America, you see more and more a lot of injustice happening, don't you? It's 
kind of everywhere you look, on the news, and well, it's just kind of everywhere. Uh, you don't even have to turn on the TV anymore. Used to, you just don't turn on the TV, you don't have to worry about it, but now, I mean, it's everywhere. It's, it's everywhere, even if you don't turn on the TV. But, you know, so here we have Paul, who is killed by the government unjustly, saying rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. And that's because there's a general principle here. Now, I'm going to read the rest of the verse, but I just want to explain this general principle. You know, I don't know if I've ever, ever worked with a druggie who didn't have a problem with cops. I can't think of one. They all seem to hate cops. Cops are the problem with everything in the world. And it's like, well, maybe you should stop breaking the law. Have you guys ever seen that one movie? And I know Jim Carrey's not a big fan favorite here, but have you guys ever th- seen that movie with Jim Carrey called Liar, Liar? It's about a, a, a lawyer. <laughs> they can't lie. Imagine that. So uh, he, 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 he has with this one client that keeps calling him and getting himself in trouble. And, hey, what can I do about this? What are you going to do about this? What are you going to do? And finally, because he can't tell for a day, he can't, he can't lie. So he has to tell the truth. He says, stop breaking the law. And he hangs up on him. Yes, absolutely. If you don't break the law, there's a lot less for the law to get you in trouble with, you know. I've noticed that cops don't pull me over if I'm not speeding. They, they don't pull you over for going the speed limit. Have you noticed that? It's this miracle thing, and you wouldn't know it because uh, whenever there's a traffic accident, there's a, you know there's police over on the side. You always see people slow way down; they're going like 15 under because we don't want them to pull us over for doing the speed limit. <laughs> I don't think that they're gonna. Whoa, let's leave this. Let's leave this uh, this situation here with the drug with the, all the drugs in the car. Let's leave them alone. They're going the speed limit. Get them down. It just. <laughs> You guys didn't think that was funny. <laughs> I think it's funny, but whatever. Do you want to be unafraid of the one in authority? Do what is good, and you will have its approval, generally speaking. For it is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, because it does not carry the sword for no reason. For it is God's servant, an avenger that brings wrath on the one uh, who does wrong. So by and large, this is true, that if you don't cause problems, you won't have as many problems. I mean, yeah, we live in a fallen world. There's going to be problems. But by and large, if you don't go around causing a problem, you're going to be a lot better off. So when we get to verse verse 2, let's back up to 2, and it says this. It says, So then the one who resists the authority is opposing God's command, and those who oppose it will bring judgment on themselves. This is extremely important because we're dealing with this right now. This isn't a hypothetical of some day far off. This is something we're dealing with right now. Be very careful that your American freedom doesn't lead you into sin. Be very, very careful, okay? We live in very divisive times um, and know where the line is between your views and your Christian obligations. Just be aware of this. Uh, It is God's servant, and it says in the beginning of verse 4, and then again in verse 4 it says, it is God's servant. It says it two times in one single verse. When you have a rebellious, stubborn attitude as a Christian that rejects authority, you are raging against God. We have to be careful as Christians that we don't have that attitude in us. And it says here in verse 2, it says, so then the one who resists the authority is opposing, okay? And he goes on to say, those who oppose it will bring judgment on themselves. Judgment from who? Judgment from who? Who are, who are we getting judgment from? Well, the, both, actually. Government, firstly. Absolutely, yes. Uh, when you rage against the machine, the machine will run you over. But then also, uh, God, too. God does not take disrespect and disauthority overly well. Okay. So obviously there are exceptions to every rule. For instance, when we look at Exodus, and they lied to the Pharaoh to save um, the Israelite children, they got a free pass on that, didn't they? See, there are rules, uh, and there, there are uh, limitations to the rules, but by and large, when you have a stubborn, disrespectful attitude, you find problems with everything that everybody does, and you always find an excuse for your attitude. Now, God also, keep in mind that God might use the government to punish you. We see that this happened in the Bible when he raised up the Babylonians, a very evil empire, to conquer Judah, who was evil, but not quite as evil as Babylon. So divisiveness is definitely in the air uh, all around us. I don't think this is news to anybody. It's, it's kind of been like that, that on and off throughout history. But we're living in a time of, of a lot of d- division. And as in that time, keep in mind, we ta- used to talk about this in church 20 years ago. As Christians, we are called to be model citizens. Okay? We shouldn't be known as problem citizens. Oh, well, they don't do a good job at work. They're always, you know, causing problems here or there. They're, they don't support the government. They don't. And there, there's, there's definitely a line, obviously, between blind following and. You know, but we're going to get on that, and get to that later. But still, 
We should be known as model citizens, not as problem makers. God has never called us or appointed us to be problem makers. So it, it, there's going to be times, absolutely, when we must break the law as Christians, aren't there? It is, these times always come. But make sure that when these times come, you do it with respect and not spite. Sometimes we make mountains out of molehills, and then we choose, I'm going to die on this hill when we didn't have to. It's something that wasn't really worth it. So a good example of, of, of some things that we break the law on is a lot of times when we get Bibles to different countries, that's illegal, and the means that we do to get the Bibles into those people's hands is also illegal. We break the law to get those people the Bibles. And this is something, it's the only way to get the Bibles to them. Uh, so a good example of how we break the law in order to fulfill God's higher law, but we don't do it with disrespect. We don't do it in spite. We do it because we love the people and we're trying to get the Bibles to them. I mean, I- I- if you have a problem with that, you- you're going to have to spend some time kind of weighing this uh, because Paul definitely set up the example of, you know, the greater good and all that. So let's kind of skip on past that. Mm-hmm. And we can get to verse 5. And this is the last of the verse, uh, verses we're going to kind of focus in on. It says this, it says, Therefore you must submit not only because of wrath, the wrath of the government and the wrath of God, but also because of your own conscience. So there was a, there was a, there was a big question that was asked in the 90s. You know, we're looking at verse 5, and it says, you, av- you not only avoid punishment, but you also avoid offending God and becoming guilty. Okay. So let's look at this question that was asked in the 90s, that... Um, By and large, the culture said, no, it doesn't matter. And this was the question. Does immorality affect leadership? Can can a president be a good president and do his job well if he's immoral? And the topic of the day that was caused that to be asked was President Bill Clinton. You remember. No, I did not have sexual relations with that woman. You know what I'm talking about. And, uh, well, it turns out he did have sexual relations with that woman. And the question then became, does it matter? Should we care? And for, for the large part, the culture decided, no, no, we shouldn't care. That's gross, it's disgusting, but by and large, we kind of just got over it. So here we are years later, and it's kind of like, eh, it's not really that big of a deal. So the question being, does immorality affect leadership? We don't have many choices nowadays, do we? seems like everywhere we pick, we have to choose between, you know, um, different immoral people. And that's, that's, that's hard because they always told us, especially like 10 years ago, they, they told us this over and over again, vote with your conscience. But how can you vote with your conscience if they all fall short? Oh, I don't know, guys. This is getting harder and harder to have the right answers. This is something you really have to pray and weigh. But I would say this. I would say don't be moved to inaction because you feel like you don't have a choice that you want. Pray about it. Consider your options. Weigh the different people running for different positions. Compare. Pray some more. And then vote. Now, that leaves two basic understandings. And this is where we're going to close off. What is your responsibility and what is God's responsibility? Your responsibility is this. Stand for truth. I don't know exactly what that looks like in your context, but through prayer and through the Bible, I think you can figure that one out for yourself in your own context. Okay, what does that mean for you? For me, standing for truth isn't about me going out to rallies and and different things like that. For me, standing for truth is preaching Christ. It's voting, and it's trying to personally live out the things that I want to see in them. There's not a whole lot more that I feel like I can do, but it's a start. So vote wisely, absolutely, but here's the thing. Your one vote is not going to fix or ruin the entire world. Okay? It's all right. Don't put so much weight on yourself. Voting really is the minimum that you can do anyways. I mean, if you think about it, which blows me out because a lot of people don't even just, don't even show up to vote. I'm just, that blows me away. Uh, Voting is really the minimum that you can do um, for the situation. And a lot of times we do this. We vote once every four years and we just kind of, hope for the best for the rest of it. But there's a lot of other voting that is really actually kind of important. And uh, then also don't forget that as much as you might treasure voting, the day will come when voting ends. 
the rights and privileges and, and, and freedom that we've enjoyed for so many years is not going to extend forever. I can guarantee that when the Antichrist comes, there will not be voting. I can guarantee it. So uh, then that takes us to God's side. As far as it is, you know, you do the voting, you do what you feel like you've got to do, but trust God because he is in control, not your vote. There was never a moment when your vote was in control. It's always God in control. And this is the part that bothers us because sometimes God brings good results and sometimes he brings bad results. But ultimately, God still brings a result. See, when we got the last president in, God is the one who allowed that to happen. See, sometimes God allows things to happen that you don't want to happen. The next president, whoever it is, God will still be in, char- in control of that. See, our, vote absolutely, but keep in mind that your vote is not going to override God's authority, nor is your lack of voting going to do that. God is, God is ultimately the one in charge. And let's look at what Isaiah 31 says. It says, Woe to those who depend on horses. They trust in the abundance of chariots and in the large number of horsemen. They do not look to the Holy One of Israel, and they do not seek the Lord. Or look at Psalm 118, which says this, It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in humanity. So this is how I'm going to kind of wrap, wrap things up, okay? There's a couple more things I want to say, but this is pretty much the main idea here. Vote for without believing in. You get what I'm saying? Your trust and your faith should never be in any candidate. However, you should vote. See what I'm saying? Vote for whoever your conscience leads you to as you pray and as you consider. But don't put your trust and your belief in them. Keep your trust and belief in God. Knowing that God will bring about what God brings about. See what I mean? I'm not saying it's completely out of our con- out of our hands, but I am saying there's a large part of it that's not really up to us. So do the bit that is in your control and leave the rest of it to God. And you hear people say this. They say, I can't do that because of what Edmund Burke said. He said, all that's necessary for evil to triumph in the world is that good men do nothing. I understand the point, but no, that's not true. I'll give you a couple examples. Number one, Jeremiah. There were a lot of people during the prophet Jeremiah's time doing the right thing. It did not change the course of the nation. In fact, God said this, stop praying for them because I'm not listening to your prayers. I will not, I will not prevent this. Second example, in the book of Revelation, the enemy has, has won. They've taken over, right? The Antichrist is in control. There's no righteous people. Nobody's doing anything right. And then God shows up in the scene. He breaks through and he fixes the whole thing. Good people weren't doing anything, but God still did. And the third example is in the book of Kings. You see time and time again, a good king will follow a bad king and a bad king will follow a good king. No rhyme or reason to it. So with all that being said, yes, prayer changes things. Absolutely. And do what you can. Absolutely. Because I believe Dolores posted it this week. Sometimes we're leaning on a shovel asking God to dig a hole. (laughs) Yes, absolutely, you should, you should pray and, and do, do what you can, absolutely. But ultimately, it's not up to the power and wisdom and strength of man to fix a corrupt society. Thank God. Ultimately, we're trusting God with this thing. When I look at the church fathers, I see them saying pretty much the same thing. Now, wherever you land on their... Um, on their rebellion, whether you think it was good or justified or whether it wasn't good or justified, we need to be very careful moving forward from this time to show the light of Christ. I think this is absolutely important for us. And I saw after the the debacle of the Olympics, the whole Lord's Supper thing, which I'm still a little bit irritated about. I've tried, guys. I really have tried to let it go. I'm still a little bit irritated, but I've tried to let it go. Um, I heard this guy, um, and he was getting all worked up, and he said, well, we can't let the culture mock us as Christians. We have to stand up for our religion or else people won't take us seriously. What Bible are you reading, dude? What are you talking about? Yes, we can let people mock us. That's what we, they've been doing since the day Jesus came. Like That's not something we have to, well, we got to stand. No, let them mock us. Actually, we're called to be mocked. That's actually what we have been called to do. Let's look at uh, 2 Peter 3, three, which says this, Above all, beware of this. Scoffers will come in the last days, scoffing and following their evil desires. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. 
we are called to endure. We're not called to rise up politically. We're not supposed to raise up a, a superpower. We're not supposed to raise up, uh, you know, a, a home, a, a, a church militia group. We're not supposed to do those kinds of things. We're supposed to tell people about Jesus and move the light forward. And so obviously this is, th- is going to be something we're going to have to look at a lot more in the coming weeks. Um, you know, because there's, in America at least, there's a huge divide between politics and religion. And a lot of my friends from like Africa, for instance, this isn't really a thing for them. And I think that it, we would do well for it to stop being a thing for us. I, I really, there really shouldn't be a big divide between politics and religion. We should look to God, we should trust in God, but we should also pray knowing that God is a part of politics too. Isn't that what the entirety of First and Second Kings shows us? That God is, is definitely moving in politics too. So we should be involved with politics. We shouldn't, we shouldn't not vote. We shouldn't not, absolutely. But I think that we just need to have a little bit of wisdom as we address these coming years because it's going to get worse more than likely, not, not better. We're going to have some good years, but there's going to be a lot of things that get, get a lot worse. So we'll pick up here next week with, with Second Chronicles and kind of look at that a little bit more. Um, but we're going to go ahead and close out here. Uh, probably already went too long anyways. Lord, thank you for today. I pray you'd bless those who are here and uh, help them as they go throughout their their days. Um, Just help them to figure out how to show uh, the light of Christ among such terribly politically difficult days. You would give them wisdom to know what to say and what not to say. That you would, um, Lord, just help them not to be moved to such a point by the news or the different things going on that that they lose their peace and comfort in you. Lord, instead that you'd give them a firm foundation in your word, help it to tie them down and help their, help their hearts not to be troubled and help their hearts not to run away, but help, help them to focus in on you and to seek you with a whole heart. And uh, God, as, as we vote and as we do different things, that you would move in politics and move in the situations and whatever happens, good or bad, that you would use it to bring glory to your kingdom. Whatever happens, whether it's good or bad, that you would use it to bring glory to your kingdom. We thank you, Lord.